So welcome everybody to another Legal Tech Talk session where we deliver instant access to education on challenging content and real world expertise. As many of you know, we've been delivering Legal Tech Talks since April and our virtual portfolio continues to deliver high quality content, such as this insightful and thought provoking session today, uh, the GC Roundtable chaired by Andrew Haslam from Squire Patton Boggs. So before I hand over to our esteemed guests and our chair of today's roundtable, we um, are going to encourage all of you who are listening today to ask questions live to the panel. So you can do this three different ways. One, click your name in the participants to raise your hand and to ask your question live to our panel and to Andrew, who um, is chairing today. Alternatively, you can put your question through the chat window, which you will see um, just to the right of the screen or alternatively through the Q&A, which is at the bottom. And again, we will come to your questions um, as and when. If we get a, quite a few, we will, make, we will do our best to get through all of them. And if possible afterwards, I'm sure some of the um, panel may be able to assist your questions directly. So through today's session, we'll also be running some short, uh, short poll to get your insights and to drive this discussion. So now, without further ado, I welcome Andrew Haslam, um, who will run through today's roundtable and introduce our esteemed guest, Andrew. Hi everyone. Welcome to this uh, session. We've got uh, three uh, general counsel with us today, uh, in uh, not the order that I've got them on my screen, but first of all is Katie Sherritt, uh, who's worked as an in-house uh, lawyer in educational publishing for most of her career, uh, moving to the uh, press in May 2018. She's responsible for legal and compliance and leads a team of 30 plus people supporting an international business. Uh, before joining the press, uh, she worked at Pearson's, firstly as a junior lawyer, and then as a senior vice president, chief privacy officer, and associate general counsel for its £1 billion core markets group. She trained at Linklaters, having graduated north from the London School of Economics, and was in the commercial team at Charles Russell before the move in-house. We also have with us Chantelle Zemba, who is Deliveroo's uh, new general counsel, joined them, jo sorry, was appointed as general counsel in April 2019. Uh, Chantal sits on Deliveroo's management team and plays a key role as Deliveroo seeks to become the definitive food company. Uh, Ms. Semba worked at Deliveroo's as head of corporate and compliance since February 2017, and that time she's overseen the company expanding into new markets, including Taiwan and Kuwait, as well as expanding rapidly in existing territories, such as the UK, France and Italy, uh, and 25 Penrose in Cardiff, who's now a Deliveroo subscriber. Uh, Jeremy Barton is general counsel of KPMG, one of the largest member firms of KPMG's sort of global network, providing audit, tax and advisory service. Leaving a team, leading a team of 80 people is responsible for legal and compliance uh, and corporate governance matters and advises the chairman and board on practice protection, strategic mergers and acquisitions and legal and regulatory risk. And he's a member of the executive leadership team. And finally me, Andrew Haslam. I was an independent e-disclosure consultant for some 20 years. In August 2019, I joined Squire Patton Boggs as their UK e-disclosure practice manager. Uh, what follows are my own views and not, do not reflect company policy. I've worked with Francis uh, since the start of NetLaw Media. And I'm looking forward to an interesting session today. What we're going to do is actually um, just do a little introduction to our working environment. Uh, I'm kicking off so you've got sort of tone of what it is. I'm in ho home in Cardiff in Wales. Uh, I actually always was planning to transition to part-time working in for Squires in April of this year. So I've done some preparatory work. You might see I'm, I'm sitting in my man cave, uh, as the rest of the, the, the family call it. We're lucky enough that we've got a dog. So in lockdown, I've been finding lots of new walks on our doorstep in between helping to look after our nine-month-old granddaughter. Uh, whose parents share the house with us. So hopefully there shouldn't be any wolves or whales during the next hour, but if they are, bear with me. Katie. Hi. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining today. Um, I'm at home in Norwich in Norfolk, a couple of hours away from London, uh, lucky enough to have a separate space. Uh, there, there is a bed behind me, which is always a bit of a leveller, isn't it? And then um, I've got three kids at home who are pretty self-sufficient, old enough to look after themselves. And if I'm lucky, they might bring me a cup of tea and a slice of cake while I'm on here. They're pretty good at hiding from camera view. So 
uh, they might they might demonstrate that during the course of this session. Um, I'm very much enjoying not having to do my four hour commute to uh, Cambridge University Press's office two hours each way every day so there are definite benefits to uh, what we're going through at the moment. Hi everyone, um, I am working from home in Wimbledon. I have two teenage boys so one of them is doing his online university lectures at the same time <laughs> and it's me and the other one is doing um, his high school Google Classrooms uh, so it makes for a very interesting working space and I also have a 13 week old puppy that we're trying to train and share the training between all of us. Good afternoon everybody uh, it's good to be here I'm uh, sitting at home I have uh, um, three teenage daughters and um, I, I've got the smallest space so they've given me the small box room to uh, to work in they've, they've bagged the best uh, the best places around the house um, and I look out over a playing field where I can see people taking all their exercise and sometimes I manage to get out there myself uh, down in uh, in Surrey so fortunate to be uh, surrounded by some nice countryside as well. Okay, uh, what we're going to do today is look at the impact of COVID-19 on uh, in a sort of as a, as, a, as a lens, is it going to be an accelerator or a blocker of change? Uh, going to look at technology, innovation, operational leadership, and then finally, as culture eats everything else for breakfast, culture. Uh, we thought we'd do technology first as sort, sort of be least sort of contentious. Uh, and towards the the end of that, we're going to ask you actually uh, to to take part in a poll. But we'll we'll get to that. Um, so overall, we think the technology has actually stood up quite well. Uh, one quote about law firms has been in the last five weeks, we've seen nearly five years of progress in enabling, accepting remote working. That being said, there's been challenges, winners and losers in the tech. Katie, coming to you first, sort of, how, how have you found the technology? It, I agree. I think it's coped amazingly well. Um, Cambridge University Press is an education company, uh, educational publishing and, and resources and services. Um, so clearly not only have we all been driven online internally, but lots of our customers have been as well. Um, and obviously that's taking, that's putting a big load on all of our systems and that seems to be holding up brilliantly, which is fantastic. That's been the odd, the odd blip, but uh, you know, it's making us take, take real care over that and make sure that we manage that when that does happen. Um, I'd say it's accelerated a lot of our plans. So you're talking about that five years in, in uh, five months. Um, it's definitely done that for our customers. So a lot of our schools were quite traditional and slow to adopt um, online materials. So that's accelerated things. Um, it's also pushed us to digitize lots of our content and make it available in new ways. So that's obviously had impact on what my team has been doing to support that. Um, I think what's really been highlighted is the importance of having a, a uniform, reliable technology stack that we're all using. Um, and we were using, you know, kind of mostly Microsoft, but different bits of it. And, and I'd say Teams has definitely come out as, as the overall winner here, uh, both in terms of supporting meetings and, and for collaboration and communications uh, between, certainly within team environments. Um, how, how are you finding the meetings? Is it, is it sort of easier on screen, sort of slightly harder without that personal touch? There's kind of two elements to it, I'd say. I think that because everyone's contributing or participating online, it's, it's made it a lot easier for everyone to participate properly, whereas before we might have had mixed meetings with some people in a room and some people online, and that they weren't being managed as well as they could have. So I'm sure we will return to that, but I hope we'll do it much more mindfully. Um, I think the load of how exhausting these meetings are um, needs us to develop some new strategies to cope. So I think we probably could be doing a better job of managing them really well to a tight agenda, ideally not making them too long, having gaps between them, those kinds of things are things we need to do to adjust. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one other new bit of technology that we've used is uh, as part of trying to engage everybody in my team and keep everyone, uh, you know, help with well-being and, and in interaction with each other that isn't just purely work related. We've been having regular quizzes. So we've we found a new tool called Kahoot, um, which is quite a fun way of, of managing quizzes. And actually, I can see a real opportunity there for us to use it for maybe delivering training in future. So uh, so that's my my little little hint my little tip about a new bit of technology tiny, tiny thing but it's uh, it's been really powerful amongst the team 
Uh, but the one thing I'd say I haven't found is a good substitute for a post-it session. So how do you replicate that experience of sharing ideas in that very uh, physical way, you know, sticking sticking notes up on the board? Um, if anyone's got any ideas about that, that's that's the thing that I feel like we're really missing. Chantal, I think you, you equally sort of found some... So you've been missing the post-its, but how's the, how's the technology been going for yourselves? Yeah, good. So um, Deliveroo was pre-COVID very much set up to work remotely anyway. So the whole company works from laptops. Um, we have, we use Google Suite, so Google Docs, Google Meet. Um, and we also use Slack so that we can, um, you know, have sort of group chat sessions very easily. And we also use Facebook Workplace just as a way to kind of communicate on a company-wide level. So we were, it wasn't very difficult for us to um, uh, pick up and kind of work remotely uh, once COVID hit. Um, but yes, I think the, the trickier thing has been um, keeping um, the, the kind of energy that you get in the office. And that's obviously very important for a startup company because we are innovating and collaborating all the time. And so that energy in the office is really important. And often we're dealing with difficult problems and need to have brainstorming sessions. So I find that the technology is actually, it makes it harder to do that. How's your working day sort of been? Um, the uh, Longer, <laughs> I think <laughs> so. You, we're not, so the commute time has turned into work time. Um, so yeah, ve very much longer days. Uh, in, in the beginning, it didn't start off like that, uh, but it has definitely moved to that now. So that it's very difficult mm -hmm. to uh, insert breaks into the day because it's quite easy just to go from Google Meet to Google Meet to Google Meet without. And so, so, yeah, I've been sat here for, for five hours. Of, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Did, did you get any, I, I was seeing somewhere some law, uh, some, some organizations have, have got levels of which you automatically got kit at home. Yeah, you know, and, and depending on, have you got a new chair or, or, or screens um, or anything like that? I, I personally haven't, but people have definitely done that. So we've had our IT team sort of, um, you know, shipping things all over the place, whether it's big screens or chairs, et cetera, to make sure that people are working in a comfortable manner. And I think you, you've had some quite, quite an expansion of the team and you haven't even met some of them yet, have you? Yeah, that's right. So um, in the last 12 months, we've gone from a team of uh, a, glo a global legal team of 10 to 37. Um, so some of the new people started, uh, and I haven't actually met them in person yet, so they started whilst we've been working from home. Um, Jeremy, you, you've also got a global team. How's, how's the technology and things been for you? Well, Andrew, it's been um, uh, quite fortunate, actually, because as an organisation, we had just adopted Teams um, before the, uh, the lockdown, and so um, it was perfect timing, really, for us. And, um, and I would say that, you know, as, as for Katie, the team's environment is something which everyone's getting used to now and is working very well for us. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the, 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 the things I haven't quite settled into yet is the hierarchy of uh, channels. So, you know, you still find emails being used, Teams chats and Teams groups are being used. Uh, sometimes, uh, dare I say, WhatsApp gets used. Um, and uh, SMS, traditional old SMS, and working out, you know, what is someone's preferred channel? Uh, how are you going to get their attention? Um, sometimes I like to multi-channel, so even during a meeting, I might resort to SMS just to, to get a message to somebody quietly, which, you know, you could have done maybe outside the meeting room before a meeting, but now you have to find an alternative way to have that little and bit you of... you pass uh, notes without teacher watching here. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so... Um, uh, so I think, you know, it's, it, it, those are some of the interesting dynamics really, I think going on as we, uh, as, as we, um, uh, adapt to this, this new mode of operating. Do you feel it's, you've sort of brought your team closer together? Cause I know you, you, you've got quite, as I say, you are, you're definitely. So it, 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 the team, the team is interesting, has got closer because certainly during the first month or so of the lockdown, um, we were having far more small group get togethers, um, which uh, in our lingo, they, they were called huddles. And so uh, teams would come together um, uh, very frequently. And um, already in a team where some people might've been working from home, you might've had some disconnect in the ordinary BAU before, um, 
interestingly, with everybody then working from home, uh, everybody was involved in those huddles and got together. And, um, and that's continued. So although with perhaps less frequency now than it was in the early stages, I would say that interestingly, the, um, the team is probably tighter. Cool. Right. I've now uh, going to excuse me peering as I work my way around the screen, but we've had a couple of sort of feedback already, which is uh, is great. In terms of uh, Katie, you were asking about you know whiteboards and and stickies and so on. Uh, uh, I don't. Know. Well, James has done this to all panelists. So so James Grice. Uh, apologies, if I've got that wrong. Is Mural or Microsoft Whiteboard a great tools uh, for sticky note style sessions? And on chat, uh, someone's put up, has anyone used Miro, M-I-R-O, for online brainstorming and collaboration? It can do post-its too. Mm -hmm. So Mule and whiteboards are, are good. Uh, and we got, oh, hang on, Francis. Uh, and Thanks, everyone. Yeah, there's a, <laughs> That's great. And there's, oh, there's also, has so, Katie tried Padlet for sticky notes? So Padlet, Miro, Mural, and Whiteboard. Anyone had any experience of trying to use those as technologies? No? Not me. We were supposed to be giving the tips, weren't we? So that yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's great. One. This is a, this is the good interactive <laughs> stuff. Um, what I'd like to do now, actually, is uh, is we're going to run a quick poll, uh, which is looking at. Um, oh, there we go. Firstly, uh, what's been your sort of communications for your primary tool? What what tool have you used primarily for communications? If you then had a secondary tool, what have you used? Um, I'm going to have to expand the poll out so I can see. There we go. Uh, are these now a key part of the organization going forward? And then just as Jeremy was saying, uh, personally, what we've done within, uh, within Squires, we've been using uh, WhatsApp is our water cooler back chat sort of uh, uh, keeping people going on gossip and all the rest of it so the poll is there up on your screens if you uh, maximize it then you'll be able to see the whole thing uh, and if you can have a go we'll have a, a minute or two of people sort of filling that in I'm just checking we've had no one's raised a hand for questions that's uh, that's where you'd actually get to talk and we're done on the chat and so on so I think in summary what we said, well, we come from organizations where actually I think most people would say I mean, the, the internet as the underpinning technology has stood up quite well. Uh, I, I mean, all Chantal, if you've got two teenage boys with their gaming, do they get, I'm, I'm, you know, do they get shut out from gaming? They, they've got to be doing schoolwork during the working day. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no command and conquer or whatever. That, that's, that shows my age, actually. Command and conquer apparently is a really old game now. Uh, but yeah, but you've got to sort of watch, manage the bandwidth coming into the house. But I think that and, and has, and as I say, you know, we've seen organizations have devolved down to, uh, certainly I've, I've heard of as, you were at a certain level if you want a second screen and an external keyboard you just ask if you want to get to a next level up the sort of a, of a, a, a chair and so on that's one level of authorization you know if you need a desk and a house extension to put it all in that's definitely partner level but yeah the, the sort of, that's been okay I, I think uh, someone mentioned that zoom fatigue is a real thing of, of staring at the screen uh, and all the rest of it so I think Let's have a look at our results, if we can, Francis or Rebecca. We've had a look. What's uh, been the feedback on the poll? Oh, okay. So we're at, I think you've all seen that. 40% is Teams, followed by Zoom. I wish I put shares into Zoom. Skype and, oh, yeah, Ring Central, which is Zoom by any other wing. Uh, some have got other. And the secondary, yeah, secondary tool, I think a lot of people are using Zoom as a sort of more uh, a, a, as their backup. Google, yeah, Chantal, your Google is a bit of a sort of a slight oddity. I don't know whether it's Deliveroo was an American based company to start with, but uh, we, we, we seem to be Teams and Zoom. And um, WhatsApp is definitely, uh, definitely out in front, but I think it's fair sort of split across the, Teams, Slack, Yammer, and all the rest of it. So, uh, so yeah, I think uh, Microsoft is is going to do nicely out of Teams. Uh, certainly, within Squires, we were we were starting to sort of uh, assess it for rolling it out. Looking at um, 
want to look next really at sort of operational uh, the technology we want to sort of looking at innovation um and, and chantal um you, you, i think you were saying that that you've had to innovate you you, you know how, how's, how's life been for innovation for yourselves yeah it's probably been one of the most innovative times at deliveroo um principally driven out of the fact that Deliveroo has become an essential service during COVID. And so we've had to adjust our product in a number of ways in order to um, cater for the current circumstances. We were the first platform in the UK to roll out a contactless delivery system. Um, we have been trying to get food and medicines to vulnerable people in the UK and our essential workers as well. So we've de delivered over 500,000 meals to the NHS. Um, but previously we didn't offer uh, medicines on our platform. And so we've had to adjust so that we can do that. And obviously there are lots of licensing issues you have to deal with if, if you are delivering that. Um, we've also uh, had to you know, try to help our restaurants through this period of time. Many of them um, have been closing down. Uh, others want to stay open, but they can't have dine-in anymore. So we've been helping them to transform their businesses into delivery only. So we've had to move quite rapidly um, in order to uh, continue to operate um, during this time. I mean, similarly, our, our customers and learners are obviously have got a load of new problems to, problems to solve with not being able to be in classrooms and uh, other education institutions together. Um, and I think just that that change in what we what we need to be providing to them has driven loads of really fantastic innovation across the organisation, um, uh, demanding varying levels of engagement from my team. Um, but my favourite one, which I don't think had a big impact on my team, was um, trying to find ways of engaging with learners. So we had a, a story writing contest where the winner got their story read out by either Stephen Fry or Ian McEwen. So that kind of thing has been really exciting. I think it's uh, driven particularly our marketing teams to come up with some really fantastic uh, ways of engaging learners and, and teachers as well. Um, obviously making content available online at speed and keeping it protected has been taking up a lot of my team's time um, in vari varying ways. Um, I think the impact of the crisis has also added weight. So we had um, a legal project underway to bring on a bring online a um, digital contract management solution, which has continued to be pushed through during this period because I think there's an even greater recognition that being able to access our contracts is absolutely critical to being able to uh, and you know deliver them and manage them well is critical to recovery when we come out the other side of this. So. I'm really pleased that, that the crisis hasn't led to some tough decisions having to be made around things like that. So that's, that's been great. Um, we've also managed to get loads more people onto our really signature tool. There was a bit of resistance in some areas, so that's been a bonus. There wasn't a lot of choice. You're not going to be able to go and run around the corner with your contract and get it signed in person. So that's been a definite plus. Have you lost any projects? or not lost or had them pushed to one side you know put on one of, the back burner one of them's, yeah one of them's on hold at the moment where we were looking at some kind of matter management demand management system but that's the kind of thing where we can use the time where we aren't onboarding a tool to think about ways we could do that other ways we could do that so mm -hmm. um using our using better processes or you know gathering um, requests into a particular you know centralizing them in a particular inbox that kind of thing so we're looking at different ways of, of addressing some of the issues we had there um, and I think the the prioritization that's been needed with the demand coming through in particular areas of the team has meant that some of the work we were really keen to do around providing better guidance and templates and FAQs for our colleagues has has continued so and, and in fact accelerated in, in some areas um, are you finding so sort of management are sort of more open to innovation or, or is there a slight retrenchment into, oh, let's just hunker down and get through this? No, I, I'm seeing a lot more willingness to, to have a go at things and, and not let perfection be the, the enemy of just mm -hmm. getting on with it, yeah. um, which is great. I think that's a, an opportunity to be seized and, and hopefully it can continue afterwards. Mm -hmm. I think there's a real sense of everyone... You know, there's been a, a level of um, of uh, emotional safety felt that 
people feel able to have a go at something and apologize if it's not perfect and not feel like they're going to get in trouble because you know there are there are ways we've been trying to find solutions that we haven't done before so i think that's really positive that's something to be encouraged yeah, I, think, I think good enough yeah it doesn't have to be perfect good enough exactly. jeremy so the how, how's how's innovation working in kpmg so i guess um there are a couple of things that we've had similar experiences so for example um uh, as with Katie, the, the e-signature rollout happened very quickly. Um, and uh, uh, so that was the DocuSign, which, which was good. Um, in the business, uh, a, a lot of our activity is already technology enabled. Um, there were some areas in KPMG's work where historically you did need to be present in person. So, for example, if you're auditing um, a, a retailer or, or, or a manufacturer, you know, part of the audit process would involve you going to a warehouse and uh, checking on stock, for example. So um, uh, there have had to be some changes to some of those practicalities and, and that regulated part of our business, the regulator has, has continually been issuing updates and, and um, uh, uh, allowing compromise on some of those things. Although at the end of the day, the audit itself still needs to stand, um, stand scrutiny. I think one of the areas where I would say, um, there are perhaps two areas where I'd say there's still room for more innovation. Um, and then another area where I think internally we've innovated quite well. So an area where I think there's still room for more innovation is within um, uh, some of our um, esteemed colleagues at the bar. Um, I have been on some uh, video conference calls with members of the bar. I've even been on a, a virtual court hearing with members of the bar. Um, where you just wonder how many times they've actually uh, logged in from home onto a, um, a Zoom or a Skype. Um, and, uh, and, and so I don't know quite if, if the bar could roll out a bit of training on how to present yourself on a video. Um, it, it, could be, it could be good for the advocacy side of the profession. Um, but that's slightly tongue in cheek. Uh, I think the other area where internally we've innovated through this period was actually in our um, decision um, making and the taking of decisions at speed. We got involved pretty early on in supporting the Nightingale hospitals, um, providing support, project management support, consulting support um, to uh, three of the Nightingale hospitals, including the one at the Excel in London. And those were um, uh, incredibly new types of projects with new types of risk that the organisation had to get comfortable with and review. And so our legal and risk approval processes were, I would say, tested to the limit in terms of um, uh, having to innovate for those new types of projects with new types of risks, but also reaching sensible decisions uh, to enable the business to go forward and to support, in that instance, to, to support the, um, the needs uh, of the public and the government in, in setting those up. Um, and I hope that looking forward, we will internally be able to apply similar sort of agility, sensible approach and uh, effective decision making in the future um, not just driven by if you like the um, expediency needs of, of that uh, of that circumstance yeah i'm, I'm going to come back to chantal in a minute because i sort of i think you say that that once that barrier has been broken and you've done it then yeah it's suddenly it wasn't that painful or, or mm. things can be done in a different way but chantal yourself in delivery i mean i think as a as a startup you you used to sort of quick management sort of and so on but but I was interested, you're, you're the one person I haven't sort of quizzed on that. So how, how's your management been with all the, the innovation and the speed? Is that something they're used to or was even for them, was it a bit like, whoa, this is a bit quick? Uh, I, I actually think we're quite practiced <laughs> at yeah. dealing with uh, a crisis or, um, you know, yeah, something we're kind of not used to and then we're having to adapt quite quickly. Just by its very nature, you know, our, our model that we run um, you know, do, does uh, we're always having to um, adapt to uh, uh, laws and regulations that, uh, you know, haven't really catered for businesses like ours. And so we're always having to, to um, yeah, to, to adapt really and globally. And so I think this was obviously a lot more intense and it happened quite quickly, but I think we it's kind of second nature to us. So it, it wasn't as much of a struggle as, as maybe other organizations. Someone's asking in there, is anyone using the Olympus dictation system? 
we're having serious issues with their platform what other systems are people using for remote digital dictation and uh, just rather than sort of people trying to it's in the chat it's a public message so if you've got any words of wisdom on the uh, remote di digital dictation then then put them please put them in the chat be interesting to know um in, in that sort of in that chat as well just people's general views on, on sort of whether management is indeed more open to 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 changes and, and has anyone sneaked stuff through that they thought i've never got the hope in hell of getting this past the board but oh my goodness it's covid19 and actually you know blow the dust off it get it through and, and quick and it's out there uh, it's uh, so so see what well, i'll keep an eye on the chat yeah uh, a lot of people big hand digital degree i think that's that's the default in the legal profession uh, is big hand i'd be surprised andrew uh, andrew let me just part, jump in not on your second question but on that uh, digital dictation not a technical not a, a comment from the technology standpoint but just from the human standpoint right. one observation i made fairly early on in the in in, in the lockdown was that um uh we we can sometimes um uh fail to use the very simple types of communication to a team yeah. um, because uh, Zoom is fine, whatever, and so on. But sometimes just leaving a message, a, a spoken message, recording a spoken message and sending that by an email, or I've also done just on my telephone, uh, a personal video message to some, to, to a small team to say, you know, these are my comments or it was, it was a situation to, to share that. And I think sometimes we, we can forget, it goes back to my point earlier about multiplicity of channels, that mm. there are some very basic, simple tools you can use, which actually can, can help uh, um, that sort of human level of communication. Yeah, I was reading quite a fascinating article and someone saying that they, they, they've gone back from Zoom because actually they found, you know, it, it's trying to interpret everyone. So, you know, you've got a screen full of people looking at the visual cues and so on. And actually it's a lot easier just to do a phone call and you can just focus on the voice and and and, and what they're saying and, and so on and that at times that can be but having said that well, i mean we're, we're doing a family we have a family get together every thursday night using zoom um if i'm a large family and, and we, we were saying to ourselves it, it, we managed to do that in a week what normally takes a year to physically get all of us in the same place in the uk uh so i, I think uh, i think i think once you've broken the ice and then we'll back into it um moving on looking at sort of operational uh, leadership about the sort of things you, you you should be doing uh, thinking about um, I'm actually you might tell from the slightly oh no in fact it's not too you can't see that I, I call it the George Clooney look with the slight white bits the, the, the salt and pepper look in the hair which is a long way of saying I'm old enough to remember the, 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 the 2008 financial reset uh, which I think is the last sort of equivalent you know oh my goodness moment yeah there was a downturn uh, we did get redundancies, but I think from that there were key lessons in terms of prune where you have to, but don't cut too deep. For goodness sake, keep the key staff, because if you get rid of them one month, you're going to need them two months later. Uh, and as we already touched on, innovating by sort of necessity, by the market technology uh, and using the technology and using what's around there. And I think, we, well, hopefully we are going to get some kind of V bounce back going to be a lot of companies are going to be stronger more competitive in 2009 2010 going to pick on jeremy first of all but what, what does the panel think we're going to be in sort of the response to covid19 over the next 18 months two years and, and what would be your tips on how do you manage now to get through that in terms of being a leader gosh i don't quite know where to start andrew there's so much yeah. in ahead of us um and i think uh, one of the important things is through, I think everyone's been experiencing through this last three month period is how um, the, the sort of assessment of the diagnosis of situation of the, the, the future vision is changing almost on a daily basis. You know, if you think back to the very beginning when this first hit in the far East and then when it hit in Italy, um, uh, you know, it was just changing. The news was changing. The prospects are changing. I think still today, the future and the so-called new reality um, is, has got so much uncertainty with it. And so I think the, the best one can do really in, in terms of leadership is um, not, not thinking that any decision you make now can't be remade in the future based on what changes might have happened. And you, and you really have to recognize that your decisions are based on the information you've got today, um, reasonable expectations into the future, however far that is, short, medium or long term, and that uh, you will continually have to be able to, to, to revise and reorient yourself. And then what's built into that, of course, which is a you know, fairly classic approach to, to, to um, 
uh, operational decision making um, is that as you're as you're taking those decisions you are communicating and also being agile so that you're building up a resilience within the organization so that things can be changed if they need to be um, and I think that that is what I see through this whole period uh, will be a, a change in mindset so whereas Historically, organizations often had a five-year strategy or three-year strategy. Um, I think it's very difficult now to, to really have that type of uh, perspective and say, right, we're going for that over the five years because yeah. even over the next five months, you don't really know um, what the picture is, uh, is going to look like. Um, so that for me is, is a little bit of, of, of how things are going to be looking. For, in our own profession, in professional services, in our own sector, in professional services, um, uh, the way in which we operate in terms of operating remotely will continue for longer than in our, our other sectors, I expect. Yeah. Um, and uh, our approach at KPMG has definitely been, as you indicated, Andrew, you know, you're, you're trying to retain talent uh, for as, you know, as long as possible because you, you look forward to the growth into the future. You don't want to, um, to be cutting into your talent at this point. I know when we were talking about this a couple of weeks ago, uh, the note I made, you, you, uh, your comment then was at some point the schools will, will restart. And he's like, yeah, actually, as you just said, <laughs> what seemed like two weeks ago, we had a firm <laughs> restart schools. It's now like, yeah, at some point, you're, you're, you're quite right. At some point, schools will restart. It's just not possibly the point we thought it was going to be you know, two weeks ago. Katie? Uh, similar thoughts, really. Uh, it's going to be very difficult to, to make firm decisions knowing exactly what the future is going to hold. So I think being agile, being prepared to try... Um, you know, on the basis of the information you've got. I think getting really close to not just our internal customers, but our, our ultimate customers and our learners. So getting my team to think much more about building those business partnering relationships, sense of commerciality, really thinking about what, what might be changing out in the markets that we're servicing. Um, I'm really keen to keep going with the operational efficiencies that we're, we're trying to drive because I think those are only going to help free up the team's time to do more of that, um, you know, more, more useful, rich business partnering with, with colleagues rather than churning through the, the BAU stuff that, that really we want to try and make as smooth and, and streamlined as possible um, and hopefully be able to pre protect as many jobs as possible. I mean, that's the, the scary thing about what, what the next 12 months hold. Um, I think just, you know, uh, we'll, we'll come on to this again shortly, but communication, just being open and transparent with the team and, and continuing with some of the really good stuff that's come out of this around, around open communication and, and a lot more personal connectedness um, with colleagues, I think. For us, I think, you know, COVID uh, is probably going to be a reset of, of the industry. And and whenever that happens, I think there are a lot of opportunities that, that can come out of that. And so I think we just need to keep our eyes open to that and see those opportunities and kind of take them. Um, we're also going to have to, uh, in the context of Deliveroo, you know, we, we're a loss-making company. We have to constantly raise capital. That's going to be harder during COVID. And so we have to think of ways that we can work in a leaner way and make our money go further, which I think is a, you know, it's a good thing. It takes you back to those early days of when you start a company and being scrappy and kind of, um, you know, hustling a bit and making things go further. I think that's really important. Um, we have to think about how COVID is going to change the way that our customers behave in the future, especially if there's going to be a big economic downturn. How is that going to change customer behavior when they're ordering food? How is that going to change our restaurants? And will restaurants survive this? What is our restaurant mix going to look like going forward? Is it going to be, you know, the, the big chains who, who are going to survive? How, what is the mix going to be between the big chains and the independent restaurants? How do we make sure that the independent restaurants survive this? What can we be doing as, as business partners with them to help them survive? Um, on the rider side, you know, they're very much being classed as essential workers during this crisis. How do we, when that tag um, is gone, how do we ensure that our riders still feel essential um, because they are performing, you know, what we think is a very important service. And so how do we keep that going post COVID? Um, so yeah, we've got a, a lot of things to think about, but I, I do um, think it's also very exciting because 
new things will come out of this. I'm going to come back to Katie in a second because I think we're picking up there. You're talking about sort of loyalty, and I've been seeing uh, we ourselves. So I'm just saying that personally down here, we, we we've always had our sort of veggie man comes around on the Thursday night and delivers veg. And uh, thank goodness we're on his list because he, he he got filled up very quickly when he was the only way of doing it. But we, we, the loyalty has been built, and and we've been looking at my my son uh, stepson has found a local brewery that does deliveries, and having found it, it's like this is amazing stuff, and it turns up once a week, and you know, and it's really good. I know also Deliveroo. I think you're seeing, you know, you're hoping that you sort of got the the loyalty there, the people you you supported through, and Katie, you were saying, I think it's more. Are you looking at how, if you've been, you've if you've won the story writing competition, if you've tried to engage more with people, you know, how how do you then hope will they stick with you? Do you think? Well, that's that's part part of what we're hoping. Though though, um, I I think I can be fair to my marketing colleagues and say that wasn't top of mind when they were doing it. I think it was about trying to support a lot of teachers with. Uh, trying to teach online who'd never done it before so if you're talking about barristers I think there's a large swathe of the teaching population who'd never done it before either so um, we, we, we produced a lot of resources around that and we've had some really lovely feedback about it so I think uh, that will that will buoy our colleagues along for, for some time to come even if uh, we don't necessarily end up with the customer loyalty or, or you know it might be that, that um, budgets are so constrained in future that we're, we're still inevitably going to see see some tough times i thought you did it's value for money if you're doing stuff online you know it, it's it's a different business model isn't it mm, it's absolutely. getting that access access yeah. to it uh one eye on the time this is almost there so i'm just looking at delegates there's no one sort of raising a hand but this is a sort of point that uh, if anyone's got any questions then do please either put them up on chat or raise your hand i'm just scrolling down having said raise your hand making sure that people, i'm not ignoring anyone uh, i'll put in the question and answer um finally sort of looking at, at, at culture um and i and i think when we were doing the preparation for this it, it was actually mental health week and and there's been a lot more focus on sort of mental health issues and the pressure people are under which which is a good thing yeah, how sort of going around and Chantal going to ask you first, how, how is sort of the, the culture, how's the culture stood up to it and, and you know, what, what's the experience been like? I think overall good, but it certainly gets uh, challenging at different points in time, depending how far into the lockdown we've been, um, you know, how, how people are kind of coping. And I think um, one of the things that our, our team is a very collaborative team. That's how I would describe our culture. We work, work together across the different, um, you know, specialty functions within the legal team. And uh, we're often in meeting rooms, drawing things on whiteboards, et cetera. And that whole element has kind of disappeared. And so I've very much been focused on, you know, trying to still have a collaborative culture, um, even though we're doing most of our meetings virtually. So that has been quite challenging. And Jeremy, how's, sort of the, how's your culture stood up to this? It's an interesting, uh, interesting question. I, I would say that... Um, it's it's in some respects um, reinforced our culture of collaboration. You know, I think uh, certainly in my team that's been uh, something that we've we've tried to foster in, in a very explicit way over the last two or three years. And the collaboration not only within the team but also between the team and other functions, and also the team with with our um, clients and indeed with our regulators. And I think that. Um, the, the reason I would say that that's been sort of um, enriched is, is because of what I was saying earlier on about the connectivity that people are, um, are keeping in touch and, uh, and are collaborating. Um, I think there is a risk uh, of people getting left by the wayside, as it were, in some, in some communication groupings and so on. I think uh, it, it, it is possible um, to have a, a risk of a sort of fear of missing out, that FOMO effect within an organization because there, there may be decisions being taken or conversations happening um, where you're not aware that you're not part of them. And, um, and then it comes back again to how transparent you are and also what Katie was saying about communications. So I, I, I want to make sure that we don't have any of that, if you like, festering away in terms of people feeling that they've, they've, they've been left out of, um, of, of, of communications and so on. The other area I think, Andrew, is just in this, um, the blurring effect 
in our daily lives between our work activities and our home activities you know and um uh and somebody said to me i you probably heard it you know that, that there is a real distinction between um working from home and uh being at home and doing some work while you're at home and and the concept of working from home is that sort of that that almost implicit um uh idea that that work is is the number one work is precedent and you know and and dominates everything and i think this this blurring between what's going on at home and and what the work life is is a real challenge and i think how we settle on that culture and in a team where people's daily lives are different as you know for many of the teams people listening in in your team you'll have people who um are working at totally different times of the day because they're having to look after children or care for somebody um uh, and so there or juggle with their other half to look after children you know so we have in my team a whole variety of working hours during a day and that in itself is a bit of a challenge to culture because people expect people to be available or not or setting up meetings becomes more complicated and so getting to a culture where you've got that range and diversity and acceptance and tolerance as well is going to be important as well as each person managing to a position where um, there is if there is to be blurring that it's clear and people understand the impact of that or yeah. you try and remove the blurring and have a bit more some boundaries and clarity around that yeah i, I come to katie in a second but i know they're just the lawyers i've been supporting there's been things that you know, i'm available in the afternoon because in the morning it's my turn on childcare. Mm. yeah and actually my working day starts at two and then finishes at eight ten o'clock at night but yeah it, it's so uh, my wife is equally as you say he's working he's, he's at home and working yeah. yeah. Katie, how sort of um, how, how have you been? I think the biggest reflection I'd have out of it is, despite a level of nervousness in the organisation about very wide-scale, flexible working, some time ago, a year ago, um, everyone has been has really embraced it, and actually, it's really developed a lot of trust between people, and we've been very keen to do similarly to Jeremy was saying with at KPMG with supporting people with having to adjust their hours uh, to fit around whatever other chaos is around them at home you know this is very much about trying to work whilst whilst coping in the middle of a crisis and I think we would really benefit from trying to sustain that environment of trust and and you know keep that keep that going going forwards um, I, th I think that's been a really powerful part of, of what's come out of it. Um, I feel like we have a much stronger sense of who the team is and have brought in overseas colleagues a lot more effectively during this period because we've been finding, it's almost like that kind of nudge principle, different ways of connecting, um, quite often much more personal, whether it be quizzes or using Teams channels. I know what you mean, Jeremy, about never never knowing quite which Teams channel to be following, but we've got a number of them within my, my legal and compliance team. And it's been really encouraging different interactions between team members, people who wouldn't normally talk to each other either because they don't sit in the same office or because they're not, they're not doing the same kind of work. And I think all of that is going to enable better collaboration from a professional perspective as well and identifying areas where we can be making improvements learning from each other so that's all that's all been really good um i like the fact that there's been so much more focus on well-being um it's been talked about across the whole organization and i think that's fantastic and needs to be continued um i think that alongside the the flexible working being more more widely used is really going to help from a diversity and inclusion perspective as well so so lots of positives, but I do think there probably are some people who are really, you know, we know there are people who are really struggling and will continue to struggle um, with juggling competing priorities. It looks like that's going to go on for quite a lot longer than we might have expected. To pick up, I, th I agree. I think with the, the, the mental awareness, there is that, you know, it, it's, I think in the past, home working was either seen as a total sky that you, you, you're not working from home whilst waiting for the machine, you know, the, the, the repairman to come in. You're sat watching daytime TV and suddenly, well, actually, people are can be trusted. But equally, you know, it's not necessarily nine till five and they, they want to work and they'll, they'll, they'll be happy to work. But you've got to let be flexible. I, I pick up Jeremy's point about, you know, it's just you, know, you, you, you whether you have an out of office statement or what do you do and all the rest of it. It's you know, just because you ring me at five o'clock 
then uh, doesn't mean I'm actually going to be there. I, I like Katie as well. You, you're out of office always sort of says you've got one of those nice email tags that say, I might respond to this email during the weekend, but I don't expect you to respond to me. You know, that's just because I choose to do it. And Chantal, I mean, you were, so you were talking about sort of, um, how are you sort of coping terms of sort of actually talking to the team? And, and, and you said you've got people who started that have never even met the business. So, so how, how have you got around that? Um, I think you just have to uh, create, you know, more space for collaboration. So we've just been very, very diligent with um, having every fortnight we have legal, global, all hands meetings. Um, we've had different parts of the business come and present at those meetings. Um, you know, which has been good so that people still feel like they're being educated about different parts of the business. Whereas, you know, if you're actually physically in the business, you can kind of, you kind of have that natural interaction all the time, but not so much if you're by yourself at home. Um, and then we have sort of subgroup meetings on, on the other weeks that we don't have the global all hands meetings. And then we have lots of um, scheduled slots for one-to-ones with uh, either me or different, you know, line managers, et cetera. Um, and just regular check-ins. So I think we've just had to turn our minds more to creating space for it and being diligent and making sure that we actually do it. We have got the question sort of that's uh, as, uh, from Jonathan Elam. Um, said, so uh, I, I give, give you a heads up, Jeremy. I'm going to come to you first. So you, you, you've got a lease warning, as it were, lease time. Given the pressure on the economy and the likely impacts on firms to have budget or lack of budget, presumably, to invest in new emerging level technology. Um, sorry, new and emerging legal tech. Does the panel think this is going to be a period where there's a slowdown in the development and adoption of new technology? I'm going to put my own personal spin on that. I think that there might might be a slowdown in development, but I don't know whether adoption might be speeded up. But having given you warning, Jeremy, what, what's your sort of legal tech? Is sort of is this going to be this a period where there's a slowdown in the development and adoption of new tech? I think the que the question has got about three dimensions to it. It's got the financial, it's got the R and D, it's got the sales or you know uh, commercial side to it. And um, in my view. Uh, we will inevitably um, have a slowdown in, 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 in sales of, of tech during this period because um, any CFO worth their salt is going to be thinking, uh, is legal tech investment my priority right now? Um, so I think that there, there, there will be a slowdown probably in the sales side. Um, to the extent that that Im impacts investment in R&D on the side of, of tech companies, um, I guess there's a, a bit of a question as to what the tail is, because that may already have been going on pre-COVID and will be, have been financed for this year anyway and carrying on. Um, I think that the, the um, uptake, as you put it, Andrew, or the adoption, um, must be more promising, I would have thought. I would have thought that uh, the, the logic would be that people's reliance on technology to operate now in a remote way is all the much, all the greater. And technology, as we know, legal tech very much is also interfacing with the business as much as within legal. And I think all of that um, uh, means that there will be um, a, a bright future, I think, for legal tech. Um, I think the, the area of in-house and legal tech interactions with law firms, again, I think what, what I would love to see, and I'm seeing a little bit around the communications, is a bit of convergence among the law firms, so uh, um, a bit of um, common platforms and so on. I think if we can see more of that in the future, I'm definitely in favour of that. Um, so that would be my take on it. Yeah, I think similar. Like adoption, if we were looking, just speaking in the context of our business, if we were looking to adopt something new, there would need, during this time, there would need to be justification for that. So the you know, whatever we're wanting to do would need to be um, creating efficiencies or, you know, saving money in the long term or whatever. And we would need to stack rank that against all of our other priorities going on at the business. So, you know, it's not that we wouldn't necessarily adopt it, um, but there would need to be a good reason why we would do that when we're looking in, in the context of everything else that we're trying to do. Yes, I'd agree with that. I mean, I think in the short term, there's likely to be a lot more control on costs because of the cash challenges most of us are facing. So, um, you know, not having to fork out for something right now is, is probably going to be uh, the tendency of 
particularly on legal tech, which often takes a bit of a backseat to, to other investments in tech. But um, but where there is a compelling reason, as Chantel said, where you've been through the business case and you can demonstrate that it's got maybe quicker wins than than might otherwise be the case. Um, you know, for example, the the digital contract management system we're just in the process of uh, of onboarding. We could show that 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 has a, a clear short term. Um, benefit for us in terms of sales generation so um so that's that was great <laughs> and interesting so lucky yeah interesting too if you sort of mentioned the fact that uh, digital signatures suddenly became an awful lot easier to roll out uh, and and the barricades just disappeared because actually we can't do it and, and to me it's like for goodness sake why can't you have digital signatures yeah mm -hmm. it's all can you print out this pdf sign it scan it and send it back to me it's like yeah we, which you know, you're back in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Conscious we're into our final five minutes. I'm just keeping an eye uh, on the questions that um, I'm going to ask for top tips. Sort of what, what sort of lockdown, what about lockdown has changed for the better that you're going to hang on afterwards? Or is there anything new you want to keep? Or was it that something you didn't realize was quite as important as, as it was until you, you couldn't do it? Chantal. So I, I think this has reminded us how important it is to be agile um, when you're faced with, you know, an emergency situation um, which changes your business and the economy. It's really important to be able to be agile and adapt, um, which I think, you know, we, we have been able to do quite well, which is which has been good. And uh, but then the, the thing that I miss is the face-to-face -face contact and I think that it's shown me there's kind of no substitute for that and we are really lucky to have all of these um, technology advances and ways to communicate which is obviously essential during this time but there is also something to be said about face-to-face -face contact and face-to-face -face meetings. It's probably two things the, the, the first is, is a little bit trite to say which is you can't over communicate you know that, that, that there's this has shown me anyway personally the um, important positive impact of just continuing to communicate and communicate. But the second point is um, uh, a little bit of um, uh, the, in that context, um, the, the horses for courses principle that uh, how you communicate with people um, and the reception to, to that and the effectiveness of the communication will vary depending on who your audience is. And so I think um, for, through this period, what I've experienced is that there are uh, you know, a, a range of ways, a range of tools that you can use when you're communicating. And that um, if you get it right, then you get the dividends and the payback. But if you get it wrong and you communicate in the wrong way to, to an audience, actually that can have a, a, a bad effect. So I guess it's just, taught me some lessons about sophistication around some of these uh, around communication. I'd have a couple as well. I think, um, again, on communications, um, keeping up that personal touch and the, the focus on well-being, I think, has been really powerful. And I want to keep that going. Um, I was just also having a reflection on the prep that we uh, coincidentally, we'd been revising our business continuity planning uh, resources and, and um, support materials and that process I think has proved invaluable getting people to think about how they do their jobs being ready to articulate what they do every day so they can hand it over to somebody else not only has the benefits of enabling people to support them if they're unavailable for a period of time but has also helped with our thinking around operational improvements as well so we've become a lot more interconnected between the different teams as I was referring to earlier and I think that's that's something that we'll, we'll keep working on. Okay in a second I'm going to hang back over to Francis who so will sort of wrap up uh, the whole session but uh, I think really so to, to, it, it's skipping through our points that, you know, that, that, that the technology has stood up to it we've had some benefits and some unexpected bonuses about sort of Katie's little sort of quiz tool that's still sort of actually going to be used in there um, but I think uh, then sort of how the sort of the it's agile is a word that's been used by all three of you at times is that ability to stay agile to to, to think on your feet uh, that uh, as Jamie was saying you, you can't have a five-year plan at the moment you can't even have a five five month I think a five-week plan is being a bit optimistic yeah uh, and thinking through where we go uh, and, and that is 
not you can't communicate enough but i think that there is there's always the thing i've been on umpteen courses about email about how you write an email and get the tone of the email right and, and the ability to upset somebody without realizing it because you think that you're being humorous they think you're being sarcastic and that's magnified with all these different bits different ways of technology but yeah but equally the opportunity to get the right bit i like the fact jeremy was saying about you know just recording a little video message for one team to get them going you know chantal was sort of one-on-ones and getting the business in to to, to talk about it uh, and, and katie was sort of the the different ways you've got to, there's a the business engaging and and, and managing uh, I, I'd, uh, I'd like to I'd like to listen to the winning story you know, whoever I sort of got to talk about it with that I'm going to mute and uh, back over to Francis no so thank you very much so all of you so Katie um, Chantel Jeremy thank you so much for sharing your thoughts with everyone today um, for legal tech talks I think it's really interesting to listen as um, I know Andrew will respect um, listening to private practice and what their challenges have been and also the similarities actually from in-house perspective from your perspective um, but I think um, the connectivity has been the kind of key part which has come through that and um, collaboration and also the teams and the mental health um, awareness piece because that's been affecting many across the industry and others as well um, who may not be part of the legal industry. So thank you all for listening, uh, for joining us today and listening um, to the round table. And also, Jeremy, just to a point, we actually have the CEO of the Bob Standards Board joining us next week, actually, talking about <laughs> technology, <laughs> technology adoption. So, <laughs> so the challenges they have faced in the bar. So that is going to be an interesting one. I should be listening in. I will let him know. And I'm hoping you'll ask him the same question. <laughs> but but thank you. But thank you, everybody, for joining us and for joining us for another Legal Tech Talks. So Andrew and um, fantastically well chaired. So thank you all and goodbye.